Hey, good afternoon. I'm Rick Kess, Director of Ed Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. Uh, great to have all of you here with us today uh, in person and all of you uh, watching on your screens at home. Um, I'm delighted and honored to have with us today a uh, dear friend, a man who I respect immensely, Jeff Canada. Uh, Jeff's the president of the Harlem Children's Zone, a world-renowned education and poverty fighting organization based in, D in New York, and he's the founder of the William Julius Wilson Institute. Uh, starting with a one-block pilot program back in uh, the early 1990s, if I remember right, and we'll talk about some of this today. Uh, Jeff launched the Harlem Children's Zone, which today serves close to 35,000 kids and families in a 97-block uh, area of central Harlem in New York City. Uh, the model, you're probably, there's an excellent chance you're at least glancingly familiar with the model, because in 2010, uh, President Obama uh, used the Harlem Children's Zone as the model for what became the uh, Promised Neighborhoods Initiative uh, when he sought to replicate it in communities across the nation. Uh, as a and partly in consequence of that, uh, Jeff was named one of the world's most influential people by Time Magazine in 2011, one of the 50 greatest leaders by Forbes Magazine in 2014. Uh, he's also the author of a couple of uh, widely read and highly influential books, uh, Fist, Stick, Knife, Gun, which was a story of his, uh, his own youth and some of the challenges he dealt with. Uh, and then later on, uh, Reaching for Manhood, uh, Reaching Up for Manhood, uh, in which Jeff talked about um, his work with the youth in the Harlem Children's Zone and what he had seen and lessons he learned and shared some of the wisdom he had built. Uh, what we're going to do today is I'm going to turn the podium over to Jeff to say a few words about uh, where his head's at, uh, the work he's doing. Uh, then we're going to have a conversation. Or we're going to really try to talk particularly about uh, how do you get these things started? How do you sustain them? And I think most relevant to where we are right now when so many of us are frustrated by the performance art that passes for political leadership, uh, when so many of us are frustrated by uh, the mindless back and forth, is what does it look like to build these programs in ways that really speak to Americans across the spectrum uh, and make a difference in the lives of, of our children and our communities? Uh, Jeff, thanks for being here today. Uh, let me give it over to you. Thank you, thank you, Rick. And uh, I am really thrilled to be here at AEI. Uh, this is a particularly poignant time for me in education. Uh, I'm at a stage in my career. Uh, well, you know, I graduated Bowdoin in 1974. Quick math, 50 years ago. I'm sad to be that guy. <laughs> right? When I was in college, we used to see the alum come, you know, 30 years, 50 years, they were like in pinstripe, candy striped pants, and they had on these funny hats, and I just thought, those folks are so old, it's me. Uh, so, uh, it, but, but you know what, Rick, it, it's, it, the reason it's so poignant for me is I spent my whole career in education. Uh, I graduated from the Ed School at Harvard in 75. It was in the midst of the busing crisis in Boston. It was just a really tough time to be in education. Racial conflict, violence, it was just, we were trying to figure this thing out. Why can't we figure out how to give poor kids an education? Uh, so you fast forward you know, 48, 49 years, and the crisis in our poor communities is worse than anything I've faced in my whole education career. Uh, the impact of COVID combined with this sense of what I consider to be academic chaos. I mean, there is no other country in the world where we teach children what to do when other Americans come into their school to kill them. Every school I know, that's what we have to teach. And, and, and you think about the trauma. So I'm old enough, most of you all are not older. I'm old enough, in, in the 50s, 
right? The Cold War was going on, and they had to teach us about being prepared for a nuclear attack. And they tell us you had to get underneath your desk. Now, Rick, I wasn't a science major in the fifth grade, but I didn't really understand how getting under your desk was going to help you in radiation. I mean, I just thought, I don't know about But we did it because they told, but none of us took it seriously. Our kids have to take this seriously because they're hearing about it every week. Someone's coming in, trying to kill them. Uh, and we're, we're thinking we have learning loss. We've never seen anything like this throughout our entire, I mean, this just goes from K to 12. Uh, we've had kids who have just missed years of education. Uh, we've got emotional uh, crisis in among our young people. Uh, where any of us working anywhere I go in America, I pull any educator aside and I say, it's bad now, isn't it? They're all like, oh my goodness, behavior's off the wall. And then we've got this other trauma. We have educators leaving this business in record numbers. Leaving. I mean, folks decide, I mean, it was already a struggle getting really high quality folks to be, want to become teachers. Now we're just having folks walking away and all of us are having to bring people in that we wouldn't have hired years ago because we just don't have any bodies to actually put in front of young people. Uh, so I have been saying, if you care about social and economic mobility, uh, if you really care about that, you are watching the next generation of our young people uh, lose out uh, because our schools are not powerful enough to handle the challenges that they face. And so my, my more recent career, and, and Rick, when, when we met, I was already uh, well involved in the Harlem Children's Owners. I, I have always believed in certain places, not every place in America, a lot of places in America have great schools, in certain places, where schools are struggling, and, and let me define what I'm talking about. For the last 50 years, these schools have been dropout factories and failure factories. Uh, so growing up in South Bronx, which I did, uh, worse schools in New York City, one of the poorest congressional districts in New York City, worst schools in New York State, I was in those schools uh, 56 years ago. Do the math, I'm 71. 56 years ago, they were terrible schools. Today, they're terrible schools. And the thing about a lousy school, it's not like a bottle of wine where you're like, oh yeah, but 87 was a good year. They've been lousy every single year. And so you think about what it means, and you don't know the South Bronx, you say, well, how many kids? We're talking about a couple of hundred thousand kids, not a million or two. I think about the millions of kids whose lives were destroyed because we haven't solved this problem. Uh, and uh, it's too much for a school. I always believed in some places you couldn't just put all of this on a school and just say, okay, fine, solve every problem in society. You all figure it out. You third grade teacher, you solve all of this stuff and let that child uh, get a great education. It's never worked. I don't believe it can work. I think there are ways that we can approach this. Uh, the uh, way we approached it in the Harlem Children's Zone, uh, starting with the parents at birth, giving them all we know about brain development and child development and staying with those same kids until we get them in college and we stay with them until we get them out of college with a degree and then we try and help them find work. Uh, we think that's what it takes to get this work done. Uh, and the work we're doing around the country is asking other folks to not walk away from education or not to believe education is not critical, it is. But to simply say in certain places, putting all of this on a public school is unfair. There's no evidence that it's going to work at scale. And there are some other things that will work. And 
uh, if you want to say, how, how do you define a success? Uh, we define it by eliminating the black-white achievement gap uh, among our young people. That's what we do. That's what we've done. Our test scores are all public. Everybody can watch them. And these are, these are black and brown kids. But these are not just black and brown kids from Harlem. These are the poorest kids to get into our charter school. We're in one of the largest housing complexes in Harlem. The number one reason you can get into our school is if you live in that housing project. Uh, you will jump over all the other admission criteria. Uh, free and reduced lunch. If you're in District 5, which is the worst performing district in Harlem. So we're, we're doing the opposite of creaming. We're looking for the kids who need us the most, and those are the kids that make up our school. About 20% of them are special ed. Uh, we've eliminated that achievement gap between our students and the students in New York City and white students in New York State. Uh, it can be done. It is not easy. But at the same time, uh, you know, this is uh, about to be November. We'll have been running our Saturday program for our struggling kids for about a month already. Meaning we, we can't do that with a typical school day, uh, just simply five days. We need extra time with our kids. And while we're doing that, I'm watching schools and school systems around the country go to four-day weeks. We need six. They're going to four. I don't know who you're going to put your money on, uh, but I'm going to tell you that math doesn't add up to me. Uh, so uh, for me, this is a particularly troubling time in this country, but I also think there are solutions. I think there are answers. Uh, and I think this is the one time that no matter what side of any of the debates you're on, I don't care if you're a Republican, if you're a Democrat, if, if you're sort of a, uh, an independent, uh, I think if, if you love this country and you worry about the future of this country, I think the answer is going to be education. Uh, and we've got to educate all our kids. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think some folks uh, worry that, uh, you know, can you give folks too much education? There were some who would argue, yes, I'm not one of those folks. Uh, I think uh, a more highly educated electorate uh, will uh, make the best choices for this country. Uh, so uh, I'm excited to be here. Uh, hopefully... Uh, We'll get a chance to uh, answer some questions. And Rick, it's always a pleasure to spend some time with you. And I'm really looking forward. Thank you very much. That's terrific, Jeff. I, mean, I think one reason I wanted to have you over was in talking to you know, folks, I think there's a lot of concern on the right and the left um, that communities aren't working the way they should. And these are different kinds of concerns than I think we encountered 10 or 20 years yeah. ago. Um, some of these folks, I think, aren't real aware uh, that, that you've done, you know, a lot of the work you've done and the ins and outs. So one, I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit about sure. Harlem Children's. How did it come about? Yeah. So take me back a little bit and tell us a little bit, how did the idea germinate? How did you get this thing started? What are a couple of the things you learned in getting this thing up and running? So... It all started with data. Uh, and uh, I was, I, our organization was called Readland at that time, didn't mean anything before I changed the name. Uh, and uh, we were a good youth serving organization in New York City, kind of well known. And everybody used to ask me the question, so how are your kids doing when they leave you? Because we stopped working with kids after 12. I said, oh, they're doing great. They were like, well, you have any evidence of that? I'm like, well, I saw Anthony last week. He looked good, <laughs> right? I, he was clean and he seemed to be happy. And they were like, no, no, I mean like real, real proof. And I thought that was pretty good proof. I could, you know, I knew it a bunch of my kids and they were like, no, no. And I started then actually following up. And you know what I found out? They weren't doing good. They were doing good while they were with me. But when they weren't with me, they weren't doing good anymore. And so... Being an educator my whole life, I just said, 
what does the science say? And I started looking at the science now. This is now where in the uh, early, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, brain development was coming out. Zero to three was critical. So I'm looking, I'm reading all this stuff about zero to three. I'm like, this is wow. I had older kids. Uh, and then my wife and I had this young kid who was only one when all that information came out about 25 years ago. And I was like, we messed those older kids up. We didn't know anything about the zero to three <laughs> stuff, right? But when I looked around Harlem, there was not one program talking to parents about zero to three. Not one. And I was like, here are the kid parents who need it the most. No one's even talking to them. So I looked at zero to three, started reading about early childhood. Uh, it was clear to me that we were waiting too late to get involved. And then when we got involved, uh, that it was episodic. We'd had a good elementary school program, but then who knew what happened to the middle school? You're in great middle school, but who knew what happened when you went to high school? And we said we had to figure out how to connect all of these things together. Now, here was the big challenge. I said, I wanted to do this. How much is it going to cost? No, you have these programs, but you have to figure it out. They were like, we can't afford to do it. I was like, well, it's going to be, you know, at that time, I thought it would be maybe somewhere between three and $5,000 a child on top of school. They said, we just can't afford to do it. So if you visited me, Rick, uh, in my office, a bunch of maps, and one of them, the incarceration rates in Manhattan, right? And the darker the red, the more people incarcerated per capita. If you looked at my 97 blocks, it was all red. At that time, New York City incarceration uh, for a year uh, was about $60,000, which was, I mean, they talk about sticker shock. I was like, yeah, y'all say we can't afford the $4,000, but look at all these folks with the same year in jail, New York City. Can't even think about what it costs. Try $560,000 a year. Look it up. You check it, Google it. Just look. It's unbelievable. And if you think anybody in New York City is saying we can't lock up any more people because it's too expensive, and I just thought, how many years have we poured, not just incarceration, uh, the emergency rooms, the welfare payments, all. Why not just educate these kids and get them jobs and get them to work and let them pay taxes like everybody else? Why not do that upfront investment and just reap the benefits of that as a society later on? Yes, it is an upfront investment. Yes, you do have to make that investment upfront. And luckily, uh, my partner in this work, Stan Druckenmiller, uh, who is one of the foremost, uh, I think, financial geniuses, uh, he was unafraid of the kind of support it would take for us to try. And it was a theory, Rick. We didn't know if it was going to work. Our theory was, let's try and transform not just the lives of these children, but the neighborhood and the community they live in. So now people know about our work at the Harlem Children's Zone because they know we've eliminated the achievement gap. What they don't know is all the parks we've cleaned up, all the playgrounds we repaired, all the graffiti we removed, all of the abandoned cars we got taken out. We wanted to make a Harlem community that was falling down. With 20% uh, of the buildings were abandoned, you had trash all over, you had drugs. We wanted to turn that into what we would consider to be a middle class community. And, and we went out to do that. And so at the same time, we were building these cradle to career efforts. We were rebuilding the community. We were cleaning it up. We were creating tenant associations and block associations. So they were actually units of change on the individual blocks and leaders who were prepared to step up and fight for their community. Uh, and that work became the essential work of the Harlem Children's Zone. It wasn't just education and after school and all the other great stuff. It was can't we transform a community and, and change the culture? So, 20 years ago, we first started. You stop a kid in Harlem. Hey, you, you, you in college? They know. You know anybody that goes in college? They think, oh, I think there's this kid on like 128th Street. I think she's in college. And you say, could you go to college? No, no one from Harlem goes to college, right? 
We got over 900 kids in college right now. You come and you find any of the kids in my zone. All my kids come home in the summertime. They will all come to work for us. You got all these kids work. You say, you know anybody in college? Everybody in Harlem goes to college. Do you think you go to college? They say, if he can go to college, I know I can go to college, right? Because you, you have all of the good, the bad, and the ugly when you reach scale. And we wanted to change the culture from one where kids thought, if you're a Harlem kid, it means you're tough. It means you fight. It means you hustle. Too. If you're a Harlem kid, it means you study, it means you work hard, it means you go on to college. That was also part of the reason we went for 97 blocks. Kids do what their friends do. If you can convince enough friends to do positive stuff, that just has an influence on the culture. So we were trying to change the culture and we thought this is what we need to replicate in other places in America. Now, I didn't no. try to replicate it because I retired. Well, let me, let me pull. So, and I'm curious, kind of, at the politics of then, uh, of kind of the Clinton years and yeah. Bush years. Yeah. How did how did how did that play out? I mean, obviously, it was a different politics in the day, but it seems like you were able, you know, to work with both uh, Democratic and Republican yeah. leaders in New York. How how did you go about that? Yeah. You, you, so, the first thing I have to tell you is. Uh, I had to um, give people the benefit of the doubt. Now, that's a funny thing to say. say what do you mean? By, I've, I've been a Democrat my whole life. I've heard terrible things about Republicans, right? <laughs> so then you have to say, maybe they're not true. Maybe you need to meet people where they are. And you'll find out that people are basically people. And what I found out was when it came to education, the things I cared about. Uh, a lot of my Democratic friends uh, didn't hold the same, uh, I think, positions I held because, look, I, I didn't actually want to run a charter school. And, and I had no intention of running a charter school because I had run a school in Boston. It's so hard. It just, and I didn't want to do that anymore. Uh, but when, when Bloomberg was there, I went to Joe Klein, and what I, a K to 12, you can't, sort of deal with economic inequality unless you deal with education. And K to 12 is important. And I just wanted to be a partner with the public schools. Right? I said, look, I've got some ideas. I think I know how to help. Just make me their partner. And Joe Klein started laughing. He said, you just want to go in and partner with them. Like, yes, you guys just to get together and have a handshake. Huh? He says, how old are you? I was like, 50. He said, you'll be 80 before this thing ever happens, all right? which, which turns out to be true. So uh, I ended up starting a charter school, uh, but, the, the, but, but that's not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do was just prove that if kids were not learning, it was not because they were poor, they came from broken homes, they had gangs and drugs and crime and all that if they weren't learning, it was because we as educators had not figured out the right set of strategies to help those kids. That was it. And people find that very controversial because that's blaming the adults and not the kids. But I thought if I had evidence, then I could show you it's not the kids. So we got some evidence. They were like, oh yeah, you must be creaming. So then they, they found out, well, you're not creaming. Uh, so then I thought, based on that, Everybody would, just, okay, thank you. Education is, to me, the only business that's a multi-billion dollar business that you don't need patent attorneys because you can't give away a good idea. <laughs> no one's trying to steal them, right? You don't have to protect your intellectual property. You can't give this stuff away. You can say, I got an answer, and everybody turns away from you because it's, there's such a fear, right, that you're, you're blaming somebody or, or you're saying you're not a good educator. So a part of the frustration, I think, was that when, when I knew every secretary of education under, in the Bush administration and the Clinton administration, and each one of them really wanted kids to do well. And that's the one thing. I have not met uh, a, a secretary of education or even a superintendent of schools who did not want children to actually do well. The question was, 
were they open to new ideas? And sometimes the answer was they thought they had all of the ideas. So what they wanted to know whether, whether you wanted to do their ideas, had a lot of that coming up, they usually didn't work, versus whether or not communities could come up with their own ideas and would they fund it. So I, I have always thought that the biggest impediment to this work was people digging themselves into a position where they just wouldn't even listen. And they wouldn't look at data, they wouldn't examine different ways of doing things. And I have found some of my Republican friends to be the best supporters of this, and I found some Democrat friends to be the best supporters of this, and I found also the opposite on both sides. So when it comes to uh, sort of what side of the political spectrum you're on, I'm totally agnostic. Uh, folks who want to come together and work for kids, and I found plenty of people on both sides who want to do that, I find we're a different breed, right? We, we, we go into our own camps for other things, but around kids, we try and figure out what's the right thing to do. So... So Harlem Children's Zone became the model for the Obama administration's uh, Promised Neighborhoods Initiative. Yeah. How'd that pl how did that happen? Can you yeah. talk a little bit about the process? Can you talk a bit about what Promised Neighborhoods, what they are, what we know about them? So um, very early on uh, and before President Obama was uh, nominated, and, well, elected in any case, uh, his office, he was a junior senator from Illinois, his office reached out to me and they said, we heard you uh, have some interesting data about the work you're doing. Uh, you know, at that time, we didn't have as many kids in college. We hadn't graduated as many kids from college, but we were tracking our kids and we were tracking our reading and our math scores. And uh, we hadn't closed the achievement gap but at that point we have now, but at that point we had narrowed it significantly. So uh, folks were taking some notice uh, and so we sent them the information, they asked for more information, we sent it to them. And then they, they called and they said, the uh, senator plans to make your strategy the cornerstone of his um, sort of campaign to fight poverty when he's president. Um, and he wants to know if you're okay with that. And I said, no, I wasn't, <laughs> which, which is true. It kind of sounds really dumb now. But at the time, being such a political savant, I understood that he had zero chance of becoming president, right? This was before Super Tuesday. Uh, I had known Hillary Clinton for at least a decade at that point in time, and I was convinced she was going to become president. And uh, my board members were supporting everybody, Republicans, Democrats, we have a very uh, sort of eclectic board. And so I told him, no, I can't give it to you because uh, you know, this has to be open for everybody running. I don't want them to think this is your thing. They were nice. They said, thank you. But we're making an announcement on Wednesday. <laughs> so I said, okay. Uh, that is what it is. And I thought, what a shame. And, and then, as history would say, Super Tuesday happens. He becomes the nominee. And at that point that he became the nominee. Now, this is what, what's interesting about sort of this period of time. The day he made that announcement, there was a manhole cover in New York City, right in Midtown, that blew up and someone was killed. Zero on the junior senator announcing his strategy to fight poverty, and 100% on the manhole cover blowing. So he's now, he wins the election, and no one has a clue that he has announced he's going to do. And it wasn't, he wanted to call it zone. I wouldn't let them call it zone. I was like, no, no, no. Uh, Y'all could mess this whole thing up and then I'm not gonna be able to raise any money and it's gonna be there until so no. They have to call it something else. So he, they called it Promised Neighborhoods uh, and uh, Angela Blackwell, uh, who at that point was running policy length and really one of the smartest uh, folks I know in, in this business. She and I uh, spent a couple of months sort of writing what we thought uh, needed to be in any uh, sort of grant application that the federal government was going to put out around Promised Neighborhoods because they were key. One, there are a couple of keys to this, Rick, that we thought was important. One was outcomes. That this was really about trying to make sure young people were doing better and could you actually say what that was. The other was targeting neighborhoods. This was really supposed to be targeted for kids who had failed. And we wanted a public-private partnership. 
That's probably one of the most controversial things. When, when we went in to talk to the Obama folks, we said to them that you could not make this a, a 100% federally funded program, that this had to have a private MAC. And they wondered why, why can't we? And I said, to be quite honest, the only way that I'm convinced that there'll be any uh, serious focus on outcome is if this is not purely political. I said, any governor, any mayor, any president, they will tell you it's working, whether it's working or not, when it's time to run for re-election. And the only way this thing works is if we're honest about what's not working. I mean, the, the whole point is you're gonna try some things, some of those things are not gonna work, and you cannot keep doing what's not working because that's how we got into this problem in the first place. Whether the federal government may give you a five-year grant, and they may be locked into that. But if you have a private funder out there who's putting up their own foundation's money, or their pro they're going to want to see some results. And they are not going to continue to fund something that's not working. So we really pushed. And they, and they agreed that there would be a private match. They made it smaller in some places, Native American reservations and others, where they thought you would have trouble raising money. But we thought that was a critical part of it. And the idea was we need to surround schools with supports that really matter. Uh, and uh, I think the closest thing that we have to evidence, we didn't know the evidence was there at that time. Uh, in the 80s, early in my career, we started thinking about community schools and how you could really work community schools. We had Beacon Schools in New York City. And we didn't have, we, again, we had anecdotal evidence that this stuff works, but we didn't have real evidence. Uh, Raj Chetty just published uh, some, uh, a report looking at a large data sets that he got from the Social Security Administration on uh, community schools. And he has found out that there is real evidence that community schools work. And, and you know what's so complicated about it? You couldn't have found that evidence because it's not clear when that kid's in the eighth grade or the ninth. But when you begin to look at did this matter in terms of their ability to earn money, you find that absolutely there were some things going on that really mattered. So uh, I feel the same way about promised neighborhoods. Uh, it's not the only answer, but it's part of a support of things that could matter in supporting kids who are trying to, uh, I think, overcome the environmental and neighborhood circumstances they find themselves in. Mm. And now a few years back, you stepped down from Harlow Jones from your role, and now you've come back yeah. to launch the uh, William Julius Wilson Institute. What, what is that? Can you talk a little bit about what it involves and what role it's playing? Yeah, so I did retire. People told me I would hate it. I did not hate it. <laughs> I was not on call. I, you, know, you, you know what it's like. No one calls you for good news. When people are calling you, something's a problem. So I had seven years. I was fine. Um, I, as my wife, it is, it is true. Usually I wouldn't say it. I'll say it today. As my wife says, one day I woke up and I said, uh, God has placed on my heart uh, that I have to save another million kids. And my wife was like, really? <laughs> you don't even have a job. And I was like, yeah, but that's okay. I was like, that's okay. Uh, at the same time, the folks at Blue Meridian Partners with this uh, different kind of uh, foundation, uh, they were thinking about uh, place-based initiative, right? Initiatives focused on neighborhoods that were struggling. Uh, we had a new CEO, Kwame Usakesi, at the Harlem Children's Zone. He wanted to have a national presence. Uh, so we had some folks who were prepared to fund place-based efforts around the country. My old organization said they wanted to do national work. Uh, I tell Kwame, it's, it's probably the worst idea any CEO has ever had to bring the old guy back. Right? I mean, that's just a recipe for disaster. Uh, but, but he's good uh, with it, and we work well together. Uh, and uh, my thought was that we would come in and begin to uh, try to come up with proof points around this country. Because people were saying, oh, yeah, you do it, did it, Jeff, but no one else can do it, and you got to have Stan to do it. You I make a whole bunch of excuses about why folks haven't done this. And we wanted to show, oh, no, there are places that are doing this, that they've got the leadership, they've got the resources, and they're actually accomplishing the goals. Uh, so I came back out of retirement to create the William Judas Wilson Institute. 
I, I didn't have to explain who William Julius Wilson is to you because he was right here at AEI and changed my whole view about fighting poverty. Uh, his uh, two of the books that he did, uh, The Truly Disadvantaged, uh, which he got a lot of grief for The Truly Disadvantaged, right? Because he was talking about what happened after African Americans were able to, to uh, move out of their community they had been trapped in once you were allowed to go in other communities and you had the talent. A lot of the doctors and the lawyers left uh, and moved on. And as these communities uh, began to struggle, middle class folks moved out also. And it would, who was left were the poorest of the poor. And he called them the truly disadvantaged. And people got mad at him about that, you know, uh, blaming the victim and other. But I grew up in the South Bronx when this was going on. And I watched everybody who could get out of that place leave. And all of us who were left, we had nothing. We knew nobody. We had no access to any resources, jobs, or anything else. Uh, and uh, those communities really began to struggle. But the other book, which had an equally important uh, impact on my life, was uh, When Work Disappears. And he just talked about what happens when communities you got all of these people of color coming because they're jobs, and they quickly get those jobs to become working class, middle class people, have families, houses, cars, and then those jobs disappear. Factories move, plants close, and what happens? You get all the social ills, right? So all the stuff that I spent my life trying to repair, a lot of that was caused because people simply did not have the kind of economic options necessary uh, to do well in this country. So for me, it became clear what this new institute needed to be, called after William Julius Wilson. And the bottom line, we want our kids to get great jobs and raise their families and uh, move up into the middle and the uh, upper middle class uh, across not just my kids in Harlem, but poor kids across this country. Because we, look, to me, that's the American dream. I think it's it can be alive and real, but it's going to take a lot of work for us to get communities to that place. So that's what we're trying to do at the Institute. I love it. You know, one point that's come up a couple times, which I'd love to hear your thoughts on. When we talk about parents right now, um, there's a lot of concern on the left about not blaming the victim, and that's been true for a long time. Yeah. On the right, we hear a lot about the need for parents to be able to weigh in and be involved, which I think makes a ton of sense. But we, have, we don't talk much about parental responsibilities in terms of kids and digital devices, yeah. in terms of chronic absenteeism. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, in the model of working with communities and families, how have you guys over time thought about the parent question and yeah. what does it take to equip parents to make sure that they're able to support their kids yeah. in the ways that deliver results? Well, I, I, I look, I think... I think the clearest example of this for us is our baby college. Baby college is not for children, it's for the parents, right? It's really saying to parents, you're the first teacher of your child. And what you're going to do is going to have a tremendous impact on that child's development. And then we want to stay with those same families uh, right through until their kids are graduating college. So in our, our schools, I'm, I'm the chair of the board of our charter schools. Whenever I have an irate parent who's just given the staff uh, hell, I'm like, that parent probably went to baby college. And more than likely they did. Uh, and they learned to fight for their kids. And, and that's critical. But, but this, is, this is what I tell the, the team, Rick, because I think it's important. I divide my families into three broad categories. I have a group of parents who love us. They will do anything we ask. They will do more than that. They are always there, always dependable, and they're, you know, part of the team. And then I have a group of parents who are, you know, more or less uh, struggling. They, if I push them, they'll show up. I kind of, but their lives, they're, they're hanging on by their fingernails in their own lives. They're worried about whether or not they're going to uh, be evicted and uh, they got, uh, you know, a, a, a spouse who's uh, having mental health problems or another one with uh, alcoholism problems. So they're hanging on. They'll, they'll work with us. They'll do okay. And that's about another third of our parents. And I have a third of our parents who are really struggling. 
they have mental health problems, they have substance abuse problems. Uh, <clears throat> here's the deal. We expect the same outcomes for our kids, regardless of the three descriptions I just gave you. There is no, where's the group of kids whose parents aren't really with them? Because the way we've designed this and, and, and why I think this particular strategy is important is that we're expecting our kids to spend more time with us than they would with their parents. And that's the way it is for most. Most kids are in school all day. Our school, our kids start showing up. You know, our sports team have practice starting at 7 o'clock in the morning. After school doesn't end until 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. Then another group stay there at 8.30, 9 o'clock. We'll open, you know, 12 months out the year. Um, we expect our, there is no replacing parents. We found that out. There's just no, you can't replace a, a, a good mother and father with a great after school program. It just doesn't work like that, right? What you can do is surround those young people so that the kind of uh, discipline, uh, the kind of love, uh, the kind of, I think, expectations, high expectations, those kids get not just from one person. They're getting it from person after person after person after person. Uh, it, it was funny because I had a group of, of my kids uh, I was uh, talking with, and we were doing a site visit, and I just asked them uh, if they could recite their creed. So we have a creed. All of our kids in our Promise, Promise Academy have the creeds. Uh, and um, the end of the creed, the kid says, I will go to college. I will succeed. This is my promise. This is my creed. So I remember I had my youngest son. He was about maybe 15 at that time. He had come visit the school. We were on the elementary floor, and all the kids came out to do their creed at the same time. And my son looked at me and said, Dan, I can't believe it. You're brainwashing these kids. I said, yep, that's exactly what I'm doing. We are brainwashing them. We want these young people to know that they are going to college. They're going to be, have a successful life, and we're going to be a key part of that. Uh, and I think that's what we're trying to get other folks to do around the country. Uh, and we're seeing real signs that this is catching on. I think the key, I just want to reinforce this again, is that in, in places where there has been generational failure of schools, simply thinking we can do a school redesign or a charter school or something else, and we're going to take care of that situation. There's just no evidence that that's going to work. Uh, we think you're going to have to do this much more comprehensive strategy. I mean, well, one thing that I, I can't help reflecting on when you talk about this is it seems like some of these building blocks um, are much more controversial today than they were 20 years ago. You just talked about high expectations. Um, there are certainly some educational, uh, some, some spots in education where high expectations is, you know, problematic yeah. that, you know, we, we need to give kids yeah. credit no matter whether they do the work or not. It's, un, you know, it's mean-spirited to not give good grades or to give grades at all. Um, you know, you talked about cleaning up Harlem at the beginning. Obviously, we're having some of this conversation around tent cities right now where folks are, you know, worried that cleaning up the streets is a violation. So how do you translate that model into... Uh, into a time and a place yeah. when some of this stuff seems more controversial than it may have been 20 years ago. And, and, and I think there, there, there are these debates out there. And uh, I have probably uh, always been uh, considered much more uh, moderate to conservative when it comes to my values around uh, education. Uh, and I believe our kids need to work hard to be excellent, and they need to know uh, that you can't be called excellent if you haven't done the work and if you don't have the achievement. I just think that's a setup for them for the rest of their lives. Uh, and so <laughs> it's not a question of whether or not we have high expectations for kids. It's a question of whether or not we're going to provide the support so they can meet those high expectations. Uh, and I think that's different. You know, when we started our school, um, we wanted to make being smart really cool, 
That's, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm dating myself. I don't know what the equivalent word is today, right? But that's what we want. We wanted because we didn't want you a basketball player. Everybody, oh wow, he's in basketball. Oh, that you finally, oh wow, she's terrific. You're a straight A student. We wanted people to be like. So you come in my school. It is listed on the board. So how many of our kids are on our dean's list? And 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 I'm going in there, and I want to see a bunch of kids because I expect that we're doing that for a whole bunch of kids. So the kids who are not on there begin to think they're the exception and not the rule. And changing that whole belief, I think, is absolutely critical uh, for us moving forward. So this other issue, I, I don't get. I don't get some of these issues around uh, what I would consider to be. Uh, what it's like to grow up in a community that's falling apart. It was dirty. It smelled bad. It looked bad. It was the kind of place, as soon as you were there, you wanted to get out of there. We all know those places. Kind of place your, your friends tell you, don't go there at night. Make sure you're not by yourself. We wanted to change that. And yes, if you grow up in a community and there's trash all around you and you drink a can of soda, yes, you throw it on the ground because what idiot would walk all the way down there to put it in the garbage can when there's trash all over everywhere? You flip that. And this is what we said. If you flip that so there's nothing there, kids will not throw stuff on the street. They will take it and put it in the garbage can. And, uh, but I didn't believe this myself at first, Rick, so I'm going to just be honest, right? Because we are who we are. So I was like, so... We're in Harlem, and I have this idea. I wanted to do this social experiment. I said, okay, I want to eliminate all the graffiti. Graffiti all over everywhere. This looked horrible. It's just, I want to eliminate all the graffiti along five blocks, and, which is complicated because there are a lot of private houses. You have to go and you have to match the paint. They're like, what do you know about painting? You're going to mix my building up. We're, no, no, we're going to just get rid of the graffiti. and get rid of it. And then I wanted to chart how long it was going to take for the graffiti to come back. Because now that you cleaned all the graffiti, it's a nice, clean, painted space. That's where everybody wants to do graffiti. So we said the difference was we're going to have our kids eliminated. So got all of our kids. They went out there one day. We eliminated all the graffiti. And I waited. That was eight years ago. I'm still waiting. Never came. Never came. You come walk around Harlem, you won't see it. You just won't see it. Why? Because those young people, when they clean that stuff up, oh, you better believe them. nobody's going to put nothing on that wall. I painted that wall. That's my wall. It looks nice. My block looks nice. The trees that we planted are growing up. That one of the things we discovered is despair is contagious, but so is hope. That once people begin, hey, hey, oh wait, something's happening over there. It's really changing. Yeah, you know, we had a lot of skeptics. Yeah, we'll see, we'll see if that thing lasts. Yeah, we'll see, you're gonna get tired. We'll... Then after a while they were like, no, you know what, this thing is really happening. And then people wanna be part of it. And, and that's what we saw happening in Harlem. Uh, so part of this was a, a sense that uh, if you give people uh, the dignity of living in a place uh, that's beautiful, uh, they will take care of that place. And what we wanted, the measure of success in Harlem was getting a good job and getting out of there. And we said, if that's how young people measure success, then all of your talent is always going to go somewhere else. We got to convince these young people that Harlem is the place you want to stay in. You want a good education and you want to live in Harlem. And that's what our kids believe. Now Harlem is so expensive, it's really unaffordable. It's one of the challenges uh, in this work, uh, which if I had been smarter, we would have figured out earlier. Uh, but I will tell you uh, that there is a different sense of pride for young people growing up in Harlem uh, than when we started this work 20 years ago. Mm. All right, let's, I'm going to open it up uh, in just one sec. We have a microphone to go around. Okay, cool. Uh, but before we do that, one question, uh, I suspect some folks may be wondering. Uh, obviously, the notion of uh, college as the goal for all students 
was kind of the default for lots of education reform for a good chunk uh, of our time in this business. Uh, a lot of questions have been raised about whether it's worth the cost, yep. about student debt, yep. about whether it actually helps folks find good jobs, about whether it actually is producing good citizens. Yep. Um, I want to give you a chance to kind of just share your thought on that. Yeah. Uh, it, it, is, it is interesting because when uh, we began this work, uh, I wanted my kids to graduate high school because the grad high school graduation rates were so terrible. And I began to look at the job data. Uh, and I will always get beaten up, even board members. You know how much a plumber makes, Jeff? You have any idea what a plumber makes? Okay, yeah, they, they make a lot of money. Uh, I got it. Uh, my kids who couldn't go to college couldn't be a plumber either. The bar of actually getting in college is fairly low. If you can't hit that bar, there's no other bar. I know these kids are going, where else are you going to go? If, look, you got community college. You, so it, people think I'm talking about Harvard and Yale and Princeton. No, no. I want my young people all to be able to get into a college and make a decision about whether or not they want to go. But they're in. I, so all of my kids get in. About 93% of them end up going. The other 7%, they want to go to the military. That's great. They want to go get a job. That's fine. We're not, but they're not going to go through life saying, I was not college material. They are not. And they are not going to hear that from any teacher. And they're not going to hear that from any administrator. From everyone, they're going to hear, you are smart. You are college material. And you can be successful. It's up to you, the choices you make afterwards. And I still think... The data bears us out that while it's, not, while it's not a guarantee of success, it's the closest proxy we have that you'll be able to get a job and support your family, even if you come out with those funny liberal arts degrees that, you know, and you, know, well, you got a degree like that for, you will still do better than a kid who does not have that degree uh, unless they have some other family connections. And, and I'll, I'll tell you the, the other pushback on this, Rick, that, that I tell folk. So we're on 125th Street. People, people, arrogant, you're elitist, you're going to talk about this college stuff, all this kind of... You go 20 blocks, I can take you to any number of private schools. There's an expectation every single one of their kids are going to college. No one ever mentions it. No one ever asks them why. So I'm like, why are you coming uptown? Looking at my black and brown kids. When I got the same expectation at that person 20 blocks away for their own kids. What is it about my kids that you start worrying about that now? You're, you're right. You're right about the cost issue because we become very concerned about this, right? A kid borrows money, doesn't stay in college. Now he doesn't have a college degree and they're in debt, right? So they're, they are worse off than if they had not gone. Do you know what the answer to that is? Raise the money to eliminate the debt and make it reasonable. So our new CEO has a new initiative out. He's going to raise $300 million to eliminate the wealth gap between black and white students. And a lot of that has to do with college debt and the amount of debt you come out of college and whether or not you've got a college savings account and those kind of things. And I'm saying to folks, we're, we're going to be giving out scholarships. We're raising money for scholarships for our kids. Uh, we gave out about $2 million in scholarships this year. We're raising money for our kids. If you care about this, you don't tell me it's unaffordable so black and brown kids shouldn't go to college. Uh, you're not going to make that decision for your own kids. And I'm going to just say everywhere I go, I'm saying when people stand up and tell me, I'm not sending my kid to college, Jeff, because I don't think that's a good investment. And they have money? I've yet to hear it yet. So my theory is, is it, is it a panacea? No. Is it going to be great for every kid? No, it's not. It's the best approximation we have as a way of saying that you have a shot at being um, basically uh, independent and be able to take care of yourself. And by the way, I don't hold it against other folks. Uh, <clears throat> We try to get our kids one of the best jobs you can get in New York City is a fireman, firewoman job. They pay it close to $100,000 a year. You can get in that. 
Try getting that job. Try get, you, you have to not just get into a junior college. You'd have to be able to get into a good four-year school just to pass the exam to become a fireman. And all of the kids from Long Island who decide they don't want to go to college, they take that exam so they can make that money. And my poor kids who don't have a decent education can't even get in the door to take the exam like that. So some of this stuff is, I hope there becomes a time uh, when, uh, you know, folks will really say college degrees don't matter. Uh, but, you know, I have to raise a lot of money, Rick, so I have to know a lot of wealthy people. They're my indicator. <laughs> All of them planning to send their kids to college. And if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for my kids, too. All right. We've got time for a couple questions. Um, let me ask right here, uh, ma'am. Uh, I'll ask that you please uh, just say who you are. And I'll ask you actually ask a question. Uh, <laughs> if we get 15 seconds in and we don't see a question, we'll give somebody else a shot. Hello, Jeffrey. Hi. I'm Emily Samos. We've actually met before. I do work with the Campaign for Grade Level Reading. Thank you, Rick. This has been great, of course. And I always ask a question, but so we are talking a lot in our work about narrative change and that that's what's needed, especially when we're talking about the parents. And I really like how you, you talked about the three kinds of parents and it doesn't matter. I'm just wondering, are people coming to you to ask for your advice about narrative change? Like, what is your, I'm hearing you say things like whether or not you're going to go to college, you're going to be college ready. And there's, you know, despair is contagious, but so is hope. So I'm like, you're, you got it. You're saying the right thing. So are people coming to you to ask this question? What do you, what do you, what's your reaction when you say, when people are saying we need a narrative change, yeah. we, need, we need more positive discussions around schooling, around learning recovery, around all this? So, I mean, it, it's interesting uh, because uh, uh, Christian Rhodes, who's my uh, number two, uh, we were in uh, New Orleans with around 450 folks from around the country who were all doing this work. And one of the reasons we were bringing them together was around narrative change. So here are some of the big challenges that we faced in, in the field. Uh, number one, uh, there's a low sense of uh, self-esteem for folks who work in the business, right? People like teaching, what's that work you do? Right? It's not like, people don't feel like it's the same as being, uh, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, right? Uh, we need the best and the brightest. It's one of the most difficult jobs you could do, and yet we're not attracting folks because people do not think that this job calls for that level of skill. So one of the things, we just want to showcase the stars in the field because there are stars. We know the stars from San Francisco. We know the stars from Oakland. We know the stars from Dallas. And we're trying to introduce folks to them so they'll get inspired and they'll be like, whoa, really? I'd like to do that kind of work. I didn't know it called, you know, you got folks who are doing research. They're at a PhD level. They're doing the research around changing the outcomes for young people. So that's one issue. The other issue around narrative change is for too many years, folks in the business, uh, like myself, have promised we could do miracles, right, uh, with uh, no money. Right? Or with little money. And, and it, we said it because we didn't think the real cost of what it takes to do, we didn't think anybody would pay that real cost. And one of the huge narrative change issues that we're saying to folks is you can demand real outcomes, but you have to pay for them. And if you're not prepared to pay for them, simply holding folks accountable when you haven't properly resourced uh, programs has been... Uh, in my opinion, a disservice to the field. So that's another narrative change piece we're doing. The third narrative change is just about success. We need to know there are things that are working. And one of the things we did, we lifted up stuff. We showed people videos of stuff that was happening around the country. And, and the more people begin to understand this is not just the Harlem Children's Zone, right? But they are doing this in Minneapolis, and they are doing this in, in Orlando, and they are doing this in Dallas, that, and they're doing great work. Uh, the more folks will say, then maybe I can do that in my own community at the same time. So those are some of the things we want to we wanna lift up uh, the resources so as more folks uh, develop the programs. I'll tell you a little place that we're underdeveloped right now. The amount of talent it takes to actually do this work, you have to build a real organization. 
right? You can't be like an enlightened leader and think, no, you have to build a team because it's going to take a real team. And so we're trying to get people to understand the infrastructure it takes to actually pull this off. Because like running any business, right? You have a great CEO, but they don't, they don't actually make the business successful. It's the folks who actually are there doing the work and producing the outcomes that make it work. And we're trying to get organizations to understand that. So uh, Christian knows we're, we're happy to share videos with folks. We, we are trying to document this, but we're trying to do it in a way that people find interesting so they'll pay attention. Well, you know what? Well, we have uh, about 60 seconds. <laughs> so we're going to take a uh, qu quick question. Sorry. Um, no, no, no. It's, I lo love your passion, man, and I love what you have to say. Uh, quick question, quick response, and we'll call it. All right, Jeffrey Frederick, thank you so much. Andrew Sachs, uh, Nobel Learning, uh, Global Social Learning Network for Youth, Kids Trade Learning Instead of Likes. Uh, kudos on, your, on all your effort in building this up. Uh, you mentioned like you can't give away good ideas. Uh, uh, one, is, has that changed at all during the pandemic? And yeah. two, why? Yeah. I don't get it, man, because yeah. I see what you're doing, and yeah. then I, see the, I see so many other places not adopting it. Yeah. Uh, one, of, one of the biggest challenges is in our business, we've had uh, this sense of scarcity. There just simply is not enough for you to be good and for me to be good. So I have to talk about how good I am and quietly talk about how good you're not. Uh, so I can make sure the resources go to me. And, and this has been part of the problem. And it's part of what we've been trying to do with other large organizations around the country to say, let's stop competing against one another. There's work enough out there for all of us. And all of us are good at different aspects of it. So let's figure out if you're good at this aspect of the built environment, why don't I use that and learn something about your aspect? That's what we're trying and to do. And has the pandemic changed the appetite for for ideas, are people more receptive or not yet? I, 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 think, I think people are not more, I think people are more receptive to certain kinds of ideas, but I also think people are shell-shocked and they haven't recovered from uh, the loss, the, the loss of a sense of community. Uh, you know, in our, half of our business at the Harlem Children's Zone, you have to be to work every day. There's no like, come, you know, you got uh, work remote and all that. You got to be there. And in lots of places, that's a real struggle. Folks are now not wanting to come into an office every day, much less be around a whole bunch of kids, especially now when everybody's getting sick. And you're, so uh, part of this is, I think, I think we could be seeing more of a learning, but I think people are still struggling trying to figure out what this next year is going to look like. I'm more hopeful uh, for 2024, 2025, when I think we'll have more of a normal uh, kind of routine set up again. You know, I mean, it's always nice to leave on a note of optimism. Jeff, thanks for being here today. Thanks for the work you do. I appreciate Great. you, my friend. Thank you. I thank all of you for joining us, both here and at home. Uh, appreciate uh, the interest. Wishing you a, a wonderful uh, afternoon and evening. Thanks for joining us.